All right, so I'm going to get started. Welcome everyone. We are really excited to have you all here with us today to talk about water quality standards of the Delaware River Basin. My name is Colleen Walters. I'm the Delaware River Basin Manager for River Network. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with River Network, we are a national organization. Now I am situated here just outside of Philadelphia and I work primarily on the Delaware River Basin, but we have staff all throughout the country. Our headquarters are in Colorado. And so we work nationwide uh, to help connect, um, connect and support groups like nonprofits, agencies, businesses, and others working in their communities on water related issues. And we work toward clean and healthy rivers, uh, safe and affordable drinking water, and robust and effective water laws and policies. And we are a member organization. I know some of you here today are already part of our network. For those of you who are interested or curious, you can head to rivernetwork.org to get a little bit more information. And so before we start, it would be great to just uh, get a feel for who's in the room today. So I'm gonna launch a poll here. And if you could let us know which Delaware Basin State you're in, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Basin wide, or if you're joining us from outside of the basin. And then the second question is what uh, type of organization are you affiliated with? An NGO, a nonprofit, government organization, private entity, university, or academic affiliate, if you're joining us as an individual or some other type of affiliation. Awesome, so I'll give it just a few more seconds. All right, let's end that poll. And it looks like most of you are joining us from Pennsylvania. And some folks, 27% uh, based in wide or multiple or working in within multiple states, 15% New Jersey, 4% Delaware, and 4% outside of the Delaware. And most of you are from non nonprofits or NGOs, 27% uh, university or academic, 15% government, 12% private, and 4% other. Wonderful. All right, so I'm going to introduce our wonderful panel of presenters. We have Ellen Kohler, the Program Director of Water Resources from the Environmental Finance Center at University of Maryland. We have Ron McGillivray, the Senior Environmental Toxicologist at the Delaware River Basin Commission. Adam Griggs is the Science Manager for River Network. And Aaron Stretz is the Assistant Director of Science and Stewardship at the Watershed Institute. So how today is going to flow, um, the presenters are going to uh, present on, on their topics and then we will have a panel discussion and then we will have an audience Q&A. So if questions come up throughout the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat box and we can address them at the end of the, um, of the session. We will have ample time for a question and answer. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ellen. Great, thank you, Colleen. Uh, just to give those of you who may not be familiar with the Environmental Finance Center a little background, we are one of 10 university-based centers across the country. Each center serves an EPA region. We serve Region 3, which covers Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, uh, and the District of Columbia and Maryland. Oh yeah, Maryland. Um, and uh, we partner with our sister um, EFC at Syracuse to cover New Jersey and the Delaware River Basin. We work with communities to protect natural resources by strengthening their capacity of decision makers to assess needs, develop effective financing strategies, and catalyze action. Through technical assistance, policy analysis, and research, EFC equips communities with the knowledge and tools they need to create more sustainable environments, more resilient and just societies, and more robust economies. So turning to our um, 
presentation today, we're going to be talking about the Clean Water Act and specifically the water quality standards. So our objectives today are to get you all acquainted with water quality standards under the Clean Water Act, what they are, what their role is in meeting the goals of the act, um, start to understand how they are developed, and learn a little bit about the differences of water quality standards across the regulatory agencies within the Delaware River Basin. Next slide, please. So the Clean Water Act has a pretty broad um, objective to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. Um, based on that objective, that's how we're structuring our presentation today. We're going to have a presentation on, um, one of our presenters is going to present on chemical um, parameters for water quality, another on physical, and another on biological integrity. The national goal nationwide is to eliminate the discharge of pollutants to surface water to make them more, to make them fishable and swimmable and, and um, specifically the water quality that provides for the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, wild fish, and provide for recreation in and on the water. So that part of the Clean Water Act, those words in the Clean Water Act are where we get that phrase fishable, swimmable um, as our national goal. So we're looking at how we, um, assess the chemical, physical, and biological elements of, of our streams so that we have healthy fish, healthy wildlife populations, and a place for people to recreate. Those are, that's sort of the nuts and bolts of what the Clean Water Act is about. Next slide, please. So within water quality standards, there are three elements to standards. There are designated uses, which we're not gonna focus on a lot today, but the designated uses are sort of, what are the goals for the, for the water um, in this particular river? Is it, we wanna use it to be able, it to be used for drinking water or for fishing or what? Those are the designated uses, the goals for that particular stretch of river. Um, then what are the criteria that we need to meet those designated uses? And those criteria can be either numeric or narrative. And so those, that's really what we're gonna focus on today, this element of the water quality standards, the criteria element. And then the third part of the water quality standards is an anti-degradation policy. An anti-degradation policy is literally just that. The goal of the Clean Water Act is that our water should not degrade below where it was when the act was passed. We should only be improving, maintaining or improving water quality. And so that anti-degradation policy is about how we're gonna make sure we don't each state, how they're gonna make sure that we don't degrade water quality below where it was when the act was passed. So in practice, the Environmental Protection Agency often drafts criteria, um, and then the states review those criteria and decide whether they're going to adopt them because it's the states that adopt the water quality standards for themselves. So each state has their own set of designated uses, criteria and anti-degradation policy that they implement in their state. Um, but often the way it actually works is that EPA drafts the criteria, the states often adopt that criteria. The most important thing is they cannot adopt something that is less restrictive than what EPA has, um, has developed. They can adopt a standard that's more restrictive in terms, or a criteria that's more restrictive than what EPA has developed. And with respect to the water quality standards as a whole, states are supposed to review them every three years through what's called a triennial review. Next slide, please. So again, we are gonna be focusing today on the water quality criteria part of the water quality standards. And as I said, there are two different kinds. There are numeric, which are measurable benchmarks. These are quite literally numbers. Like we wanna hit a goal of our, our numeric standard for phosphorus might be 0.1 uh, milligrams per liter for um, this particular, um, you know, for this state. A narrative would be desirable conditions. Um, they're also sometimes called the free froms, like we want it to be free from odor or we want it to be free from debris. Um, so those kinds of uh, a description of what you want that water, um, that waterway to look like or smell like. Um, and as we said, there are three criteria, three categories for these criteria, biologic, chemical and physical. And I think that's it for me, right? Um, so our next presenter will be Ron um, from the Delaware River Basin Commission. Ron? 
Hey everyone, is my slide being shared now? No, we can't see your slides. Hmm. You have to, did you go to screen share at the bottom? Yeah. And then select your slides and hit share. Oh, one second. Looks like you're getting it. Okay. There you go. I slicked it share, but it didn't uh, do it twice. Now do you see it? Yes, looks good. Oh, great. Okay, so I'm Ron McGillery. And this slide here is basically showing a number of uh, DRBC staff um, collecting water samples. And that's a big part of uh, what we do monitoring to see if we are meeting the water quality standards for the river. But also in this slide is this uh, land use map of the basin. So I think most people are familiar with the fact that the basin is, starts in New York, and then uh, passes between Pennsylvania on the west and New Jersey, and then uh, Delaware on the west and New Jersey as you move down. But um, I think this map is interesting because you can see from the land use that in the northern part of the, uh, the basin, there's a lot of forested area. And that uh, non-tidal water up there is our special protection water. And in that, those waters, we're actually um, maintaining water quality that exceeds water quality criteria. So we're trying to maintain the existing water quality. And then as you're moving south, move into more agricultural area and some uh, urban area in the Lehigh Valley, and then moving down to where it starts getting really red, the urban area of Trenton, Philadelphia, Camden, and Wilmington. And that's where you're moving. When you get to Trenton, you're moving from the non-tidal river, which is uh, the one major area of the river, to the tidal river. And that's through the urban area. And that's where we generally start seeing a lot of the chemical contaminants in the water in that urban area. And then that's also where you're moving from fresh water into a brackish water, and then moving out into the bay. And then as you see in the bay, um, you have a couple factors happening here. One is that you're not having as much urbanization. You also have this darker blue area, the fringing wetlands that protect the, help protect the water quality. And you have the um, mixing of the salt water and the fresh water. Uh, and that has uh, been a big effort by the DRBC to uh, you know, uh, uh, monitor the uh, salinity of the chloride uh, going up into the urban area, potentially impacting drinking water. So if you're not familiar with the Delaware River Basin Commission, uh, it was formed in 1961 because there were many questions about uh, water supply. The various states had uh, disputes about how to share the water. There was severe pollution in the river, especially in the urbanized area that dis dissolved oxygen with very low. The fish couldn't swim through the, the dead zone in the river. And there was serious flooding. So the commission is basically five equal parts it's the states of Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York, and the, and the federal government. And the commissioners are actually the governors of the states. So the policies of the commission are basically the policies of the governors of the states. And they send representatives uh, to the commission meetings and also a representative from the gov federal government. And the idea is to have an integrated approach to water management on a watershed basis. And the DRBC does have our own, we do have uh, uh, what we call stream quality objectives and their uh, uniform water quality criteria in the shared waters. So the Delaware River is a shared interstate water. So whenever you're standing on the bank of the Delaware River and looking across the river, you're always looking at another state. So that's, so that's what there's, the water is shared by the, our interstate waters. Okay, so Eleanor gave an introduction to the uh, Clean Water Act and uh, different components of it and how it applies to standards, but I just wanted to show how that it, uh, we take these, the designated use, the standards, and then we have to monitor them and assess them to see if we're meeting them. And that's a big part of what we do. And then we come up with an integrated assessment or a water quality uh, uh, assessment report. And we give that information for the Delaware River to the states. And then the states have a listing of what waters are, would be impaired, what part of the Delaware River or different parts of tidal tributaries are impaired. And then from there, the states, uh, we may have to have a total maximum daily load, some type of a um, regulation to limit the amount of discharges to the particular water 
to make, make sure you're meeting the goal of the standard. And that's often done through the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, which is kind of heavily geared towards point sources. So, uh, and, that's, and that's either through technology-based limits or water quality limits. So the system uh, works this way primarily, and it, it is heavily geared towards uh, point sources. And Ellen mentioned that the anti-degradation policy, so you don't, so like when our special protection waters, in the non-tidal water, we're exceeding that water exceeds water quality criteria, and we're trying to maintain that as existing high quality water. So I did want to talk a little bit more about the, the monitoring goals. We both in developing criteria and in monitoring, we continue to try to use the, the most current scientific knowledge and technology. Um, for instance, this year we're starting to work more with passive samplers. And we're increasingly getting more uh, data from uh, automated uh, real-time samplers. So we're continually trying to improve the, the monitoring. Uh, and the basic idea is trying to measure uh, whether we're meeting the regulatory objectives of sustainable, healthy waters. So then we have these assessments that would both assess the status of where we are today or this year and also try to uh, assess the trends. And trends are difficult to uh, assess because it takes a lot of data to really get a good statistical uh, data set to show a trend, but we try to do both in our assessments. And those assessments then can inform whether it's adaptive management or other regulatory or mitigation steps that are needed to uh, maintain uh, healthy waters. And there's a lot of data involved, a lot of data coordination with the different states and different agencies. So now I want to do basically, I don't know if they're exactly case studies or three examples of how we're trying, we're using uh, science to inform uh, the water quality standard process. So one is with the modeling eutrophication process in the Delaware estuary to link watershed efforts to control nutrient impacts and how that would impact environmental management. So basically, uh, if you look at the uh, figure at the bottom right, you see the, the dissolved oxygen in the river. And then the x-axis, you have the years. And then the y-axis, you have the dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter. And you can see in the early years, in the 60s, the dissolved oxygen was very low. There was an aspirational goal of, uh, the goal was set for 3.5 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. But with a lot of investment in uh, infrastructure uh, for municipal treatment, the dissolved oxygen has uh, improved in the river. And now it's uh, to the point where initially they were trying to just get the fish be able to pass through the river, to survive in the river. And now it seems like there's some propagation in the river. So we're in the process of reviewing uh, the linkage between nutrients and dissolved oxygen and designated use. And we're doing that by uh, this eutrophication model. And models are a good way of, of really uh, coming up with a conceptual model, getting everyone on the same page and deciding, you know, what's needed to be done, what data needs to be collected, and then to, uh, come up with an answer. And then it's an iterative process, but we have a modeling expert panel and consultants that are working with our staff. Uh, a model has been selected with a water quality and uh, uh, hydrodynamic model linked. There's a lot of data collection involved, a lot of data management, and then the model is calibrated and validated. And then the stakeholders are involved in our various advisory committees. And then from that, we'll have a revised water quality criteria. Management options will be uh, developed and, and implementation will be done. So that kind of, I think, hopefully gives you an idea of the, the complexity of the information that's needed to inform development of new water quality criteria. Another completely different example, but this is an area that I spend more of my time in, would be the metals. Now, metal impairment uh, is quite common in water, surface waters. It's things like copper that are at levels that are um, high and could be, could be impairing aquatic life. Um, and this kind of shows, this slide shows the process of the changes in policies over the years based on bringing scientific, new current scientific information into the water quality criteria. So in the 1980s, they were measuring basically total recoverable metals and all the copper basically that was in the water and saying, well, if that's there, then you have an impairment. But then they said, well, is that really what the animals are, aquatic life are being exposed to? And then in 1985, EPA recommended use an acid soluble metal method. And then in 1992, they went to a dissolved metals concentration method. And then in 1994, they recommended um, 
said, said, well, it's not only the way you measure the copper or the metal, it's also the other parameters that are in the water that are affecting how you're going to determine whether it's bioavailable and toxic to the aquatic life. So they came up with, you compare the lab data that you have the lab, uh, you compare a lab uh, experiment with the lab water with your ambient water and you have a ratio between the two because the lab water is pretty much pristine water and then you have the ambient water, which might have different dissolved oxygen, dissolved organic carbon and pH, different pH and different hardness than you would have in the lab water. And that ratio was used to try to determine what's uh, most uh, safe value for metals. And then in 2007, uh, the biotic ligand model was adopted by the EPA on a national level, and the states are still working to uh, implement this model. And where we are right now with this model. So the biotic ligand model is basically saying the ligand here, the biological ligand for let's say a fish would be the gill. And how much copper or other model, other metal is being bound to that ligand or to the gill. And what factors are influencing that? It's the speciation of the metal. It's whether there's dissolved or getting carbon present, hardness and things like that. All these various parameters go into the model to determine bioavailability. But now what's happened is it's like, that's a lot of parameters to monitor. And now they're trying to, the EPA is working to try to see what's the simplest biotic ligand model you can run and still get an accurate prediction of healthy water. And then the third thing that uh, is kind of a different issue uh, is this, the idea of, of, um, of the freshwater salinization. Uh, and that is something that uh, if you see in this graph that again, it's the years on the x-axis and the chloride and milligrams per liter on the y-axis. And basically uh, in the non-tidal fresh water at Trenton, you're seeing a trend upward for chloride as that, and what, that's chloride is one indicator of salinization, uh, making the water uh, saltier. So this is something that we are also looking at uh, potentially uh, to, uh, review, revise criteria, or also um, just look at maybe mitigation, other mitigation uh, steps should be taken to uh, reduce road salt or what other uh, sources of the um, anions and cations to the water that's causing the salinization. So those are just three different examples how we're trying to incorporate the latest information and in science into the criteria for the Delaware River. And I uh, just also wanted to uh, let people in the group know that, that you know, uh, one of the things that we talked about when we first were organizing this meeting is the fact that the different states have different uh, standards and criteria. And that's becoming even more so uh, as time goes on with the federal government uh, not moving forward it with as fast in some standards as they had in the past. Uh, so one thing that influences the development of standards is public and stakeholder involvement. So you can, uh, all DRBC business meetings, public hearings and advisory committee meetings are open to the public and you can participate either um, through written comments or in person. And there's also this, uh, this uh, um, on our website at this address, you can go in and click your interests in different advisory committees or different topics and you can be uh, kept informed about what's happening at the DRBC, or you can follow the DRBC on um, social media. And that's what I have to share right now. Great, thank you very much, Ron. Now we're gonna turn to Adam, and Adam is gonna talk about biological um, parameters in the water. Okay, there we go. Okay. Everybody see my uh, my shared screen? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about biological criteria today across the Delaware Basin and um, just a couple of quick caveats. So I'm, I'm not getting into uh, criteria that are say pre developed, um, like Ron was touching on as far as metals or pollutants that might be developed for the protection of aquatic life. I'll be talking uh, specifically about criteria that describe those biological communities and are established to protect them um, as, as they are assessed. Um, 
that being said, uh, this is a, a lot of material to cover in, in, a, in a solo webinar, much less just 15 minutes. So I will be skimming through a lot of this. And um, also, these are not all the tools that are available um, and in use uh, by these states in order to assess and describe uh, biological communities. Um, so we've seen Ellen and Ron both kind of give a version of this, but it's, it bears repeating. And in the biological assessment, a couple of steps actually get added that make this important. Um, so we, we do start with designated uses. An example might be cold water fisheries. Um, and as far as the states are concerned across the Delaware, the designated uses themselves is where we actually have a lot of commonality, where typically we see um, that the designated uses either describe warm water fish, migratory fish, or cold water fish, and they might separate those cold water fisheries into those rivers that are stocked and managed or those that are wild. Um, but generally, those are the different types of aquatic life uses that we see um, in, in, the, in the, the uses that are described. Now, when it comes to criteria for aquatic life, um, these can be narrative or numeric. Most commonly, we do see narrative criteria that is simply describing that a community must uh, be healthy and robust and support uh, the fisheries that have been designated there. When we do see numeric criteria in a standard, um, it is usually because that state has adopted some specific indicator of that biological community and is that it is that indicator itself that they are using as that numeric criteria. But again, most often they leave the criteria itself as a narrative description of the condition they're trying to achieve and that they will routinely develop and refine indicators to help them protect that, that established condition. One big extra step that we get in biological uh, integrity and assessment um, is that we, you'll see we don't write TMDLs for we need more trout or we need more mayflies. We, we write TMDLs and we list rivers for pollutants. And when you sample a biological community, they'll tell you something's wrong, uh, but they don't tell you what it is that's causing the problem. So a lot of times there's an additional step for the protection of biological criteria where the stressor must be identified. Um, and they figure out what's the cause. And only then can they get to a, a, a listing or a TMDL, where we do see sometimes they do still list a, list a, a river for aquatic impairment and the cause is being uh, unknown. And we'll see some of that as we go through. So let's start with Pennsylvania where um, it, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, the Pennsylvania designated uses are, are narrative uh, and they typically are describing whether, uh, as I said, waters are for migratory fish, warm water fish, uh, stocked or cold water fisheries. And then we see that they have um, compounded uh, their designated uses into several use classes um, where that, that type of fishery that is described there uh, may also be paired with um, some of the anti-degradation levels that they have in place, whether something is considered a, a high quality or an exceptional value water. So they describe the communities they're trying to protect very, very simply as, as trout waters. Um, but if we take a look at the data that goes into uh, the integrated report, we see that most of the data that is collected that is informing those reports is macroinvertebrate data, so the insects. This is very common um, where the, the community they're trying to protect uh, is a fishery, um, but the indicator that they often use are the invertebrates. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, invertebrates, they're typically cheaper to, to, to monitor. Um, they can be better uh, biological indicators. It's a much uh, larger community uh, where we have a, a, a lot more species that we can understand uh, their specific nuances and roles and sensitivities. And so the indexes themselves can be a little more robust uh, and we can get more data there more easily to take a look at a, a larger number of, of streams. And then so typically they infer um, that if this healthy aquatic macroinvertebrate community is in place, then it, it will support a healthy fish community as well. And in places where they do manage fisheries, they, they do do fish population surveys as well. So the way they interpret this, um, and this is pretty common across a lot of states, um, their indicator that they have developed is called an index of biologic integrity. 
Um, and it is basically uh, a, an assemblage of scored uh, individual metrics that they are using to assess uh, the, the, the relative status and makeup of a macroinvertebrate community. In this case in Pennsylvania, um, they have a couple of different classifications of those different designated use classes where they're basically looking for a, a higher score to protect those higher classes. Um, and they may have uh, a, a number of other um, classifications where this is used particularly in freestone applications in limestone streams they might have a different benchmark we'll see different states deploy different classifications usually based on regionality or some inherent differences in the streams themselves so they're not comparing them all on the same benchmark hey adam um yeah just to jump in there's a question um about the previous graph um what period um the data collection events occurred uh let's see so this is uh taken directly from pennsylvania's newest integrated report viewer they develop an arc map application they started with their 2016 integrated report and they continued doing this with their 2018 integrated report so this is basically all the data that informed that 2018 report so it may be data collected within the last couple of years or, or even a longer time period if it's still relevant data for them to use for assessment thank you um, so we'll see in Pennsylvania, uh, the leading causes of impairment, they identify siltation a lot. Um, and, and you'll see that most of the listings you hear are for blue for aquatic life. Um, so that makes up the majority of, of the listings in their integrated report. And through their biological stressor identification process, um, they often point at siltation as the cause of impairment in those streams and metals being another common uh, cause of impairment for aquatic life communities. In New moving over uh, to New Jersey, we have a very similar kind of setup with a variety of designated use classes um, that are usually a combination of anti-degradation levels, so uh, uh, federal waters of, of um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, outstanding national resource waters is what they use in New Jersey. And then of various uh, levels of whether trout uh, populations are in production, management, or non-trout waters. And then New Jersey has a, an assemblage of IBIs that they use throughout the state. Um, and these uh, look at both uh, very commonly fish communities themselves um, and macroinvertebrate communities, or in some cases, even IBIs that also look at crayfish and salamanders as well. So they have the low gradient southern fish IBI. They have a high gradient northern fish IBI. Uh, they use this in drainages of larger than four square miles. And for headwater streams, they use a headwaters IBI, which is a combination of assemblage looking at fish, crayfish, salamanders, and frogs. And then throughout the basin as well, they also have a macroinvertebrate, uh, a set of macroinvertebrate IBIs. And you can see the boundaries here for where those different uh, the metrics are applied um, in the highlands, the coastal plain, and the pinelands index. Um, and you'll see here that there, each IBI is basically a, a scored um, average, so to speak, of a number of individual metrics that are describing aspects of those biological communities. And they will use this to determine whether or not the biological communities are intact. So New Jersey will look at multiple populations in their aquatic life assessments. And here's basically just an, a, a table looking at those various index scores, and you can see how they change uh, between coastal plain pinelands or high, uh, high gradient as far as what individual metrics perform well and go into those regions and what the, the cutoffs and thresholds for scoring them are. Each of those will be adapted um, separately to those geographic areas where that index was developed. Looking at New Jersey's biologic impairments um, for aquatic life in green, um, New Jersey often will list the biology uh, being impaired with a cause unknown. Uh, they use a very similar stressor identification process that is loosely based on EPA's 2000 um, stressor identification guidance document. It's basically suggests a weight of evidence um, iterative based approach where you're considering all the available data uh, to, to figure out what the most likely stressor is uh, causing a biological impairment. Um, and then they have also identified frequently phosphorus, dissolved oxygen, and pH and temperature. 
um, as common pollutants driving their, bi their biological impairments. Uh, New York similarly, uh, similarly a, a variety of use classes with, with trout being uh, a key driver of what's, uh, what's protected or describing those use classes. Um, and uh, it, this map points out, and this is an important point, that all of the states typically measure on a rotational basis. So they may not get back to a particular region, usually once every five years or so to collect new biological information. And in New York, uh, they do do a variety of biological monitoring, but it is the macroinvertebrates that are collected and, and analyzed the most. Um, in New York, they use a biological indicator called the Biological Assessment Profile. This isn't uh, an IBI necessarily, it's very similar. Uh, this type of assessment um, is, a, is loosely based on a concept called the Biological Condition Gradient, where upfront they establish uh, basically what the, the gradient of conditions is from a very intact, healthy biological community to a very stressed biological community. And then using a variety of metrics, they see uh, which outcome of those metrics tend to land where in those communities, and then use that framework then to build their assessment methodology and figure out, uh, depending on the scores and the way the metrics are, are, are coming out, um, which of these tiers uh, of biological condition a site has landed in. Um, they also use uh, different assessment uh, methods based on the region, um, as you can see here on this map, uh, because streams and biological communities are not always uh, uh, the same. Um, in Delaware, very similarly, we have a variety of uses. Uh, they do have some, uh, some anti-degradation categories as well, where they, they also protect uh, general fish aquatic life populations, harvestable, harvestable shellfish waters, and cold fish populations. And in waters of the Delaware, uh, the DNREC typically defers to the DRBC, Delaware River Basin Commission's uh, draft macroinvertebrate assessment method, which is another um, IBI, very similar to say the, the Pennsylvania IBI, uh, which looks at a variety of metrics to determine an overall uh, indicator score that describes those invertebrate communities. And that's about all I had for the biological criteria that are, are uh, in use in the Delaware. Thanks very much, Adam. Aaron is going to take over from here and talk about physical criteria. Yes, let me share my screen. Is that showing correctly? Hello? <laughs> yeah, I think we're seeing your full screen. I mean, it'll work. Oh, OK. Got it. Yeah, if you want to do hit the present, then we don't see your tabs at the top. Not a big deal. Gotcha. OK. Talk amongst yourselves. So while Aaron's doing that, I'll just note that um, Rapika posted in the chat a link to Pennsylvania's integrative report. And I also posted a link to their th assessment methodology. Each state has both of those documents and provides a lot more detail about um, how they do their assessment that then is what they use to develop their integrated report, which includes their list of those waters that are impaired that are not meeting those water quality standards. Okay, Erin, looks good. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, well, good morning. I'm Erin Strutz from the Watershed Institute, which is a nonprofit environmental organization located in central New Jersey. And we're focused on watershed conservation, advocacy, science, and education. Uh, so now that Ron has discussed a bit about how the water quality standards are developed, and Adam has discussed how they affect aquatic life, um, I think we'll get into some of the actual standards themselves. So there are five distinct regulatory bodies that have developed their own standards in the Delaware Basin. And each of these bodies are given the latitude to decide for themselves what specific water quality standards make sense for their specific uh, coverage area. Uh, but clearly, regulatory decisions don't pay any mind to geographic boundaries. 
especially when a major river serves as the state line, like it does here in the Delaware Basin. Um, while these folks may be focused directly on how their standards are impacting permitting and stream designations within their state boundaries, um, of course, rivers flow downstream. And so the impacts of these uh, different water quality standards will be felt differently by other regulatory bodies downstream. Um, so because we have just a, a short amount of time for this section, I'm gonna focus on just two of the many parameters that are significant uh, to your organizations who are working or monitoring in the Delaware Basin, um, and that is nutrients and bacteria. So it's interesting to me because the regulatory approach, both of these parameters are so different. Uh, one is entirely numerical, uh, while the other is primarily narrative. Uh, so we'll start with the more wishy-washy of the two, uh, the nutrients. The nutrients are a, a water quality parameter that are tied tightly to many other important parameters that we monitor. Uh, in much of the country, nutrient concentrations are measured, but there's no real numerical criteria with which to compare the results of your monitoring. Uh, so the state assessment team has to look for other conditions to indicate a nutrient impairment, uh, typically signs of, of eutrophication, things like um, algal growth, toxic cyanobacterial blooms, low DO, you know, huge fluctuations in pH, and as Adam talked about, uh, poor aquatic life scores. Uh, so though many states only have narrative criteria for nutrients, the EPA has encouraged the development of numerical criteria for both nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, in the past, it's been thought that a standard for one of these nutrients would help to mitigate the impacts of the other. Um, but recent local research really shows that assumptions we have that freshwater systems are phosphorus limited and brackish or marine systems are nitrogen limited are not really what's going on. Um, in fact, nitrogen concentrations can be positively or negatively or not at all correlated with phosphorus concentrations. And, and both of these nutrients play an important role in algal and vegetation growth. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that the adoption of uh, specific numerical nutrient criteria has been so slow to take hold uh, because it's so site specific, really. Um, so the EPA release suggested nutrient criteria based on ecoregion reference conditions to encourage all 50 states to go ahead and adopt their numerical criteria. Uh, so this line marks uh, very vaguely um, the transitional zone between the two major ecoregions of the Delaware Basin. Up north, we have the forested uplands. And in the south, we have the coastal plain. So the total nitrogen and phosphorus values here are the average of reference conditions in each ecoregion. Um, so you'll see that there's some variability between these two general Delaware Basin ecoregions. Uh, the upstream portions of the river and its tributaries tend to be of a higher quality than those downstream. And these nutrient reference values certainly reflect up. Now, I think it's interesting to look at exactly what the narrative criteria are for each state, because the text does change, but the concept kind of remains the same. Um, essentially, states don't want nutrient concentrations to be so high that they negatively impact a waterway's designated uses. Um, so we'll see that described in different but similar ways for each of these regulatory bodies. Uh, so New York says they don't want excessive algae, weeds, and slimes. PA says, you know, they used a thesaurus for this one. They said it's not going to be inimicable or injurious for their designated uses. Excellent. New Jersey says we don't want it to be unsuitable. You know, it's really kind of different variations of, of the same theme. Um, DRBC, I, I, I like how they've phrased it. This says, 
we shouldn't have concentrations of of nutrients or, or any you know toxic substance that's harmful to human or plant or aquatic life. Um, but I really love Delaware's narrative criteria. Part of their criteria says, "Yep, we acknowledge it's a problem, and we're going to try real hard to not." have nutrients be a problem in our state so you know <laughs> my question to you is uh how do we enforce any of this as you'll see on the next slide the numerical criteria for phosphorus and the places where we do have a numerical criteria is really low and often the stream has not yet shown a significant habitat impact from you know eutrophication before the stream is considered numerically impaired. Um, so at what point are states with these solely narrative criteria able to step in, confidently declare a stream is impaired, and then go on to develop a TMDL for that stream? Uh, so I'll uh, have to admit my biases right off the bat. Coming from New Jersey, I have to say that I was pretty shocked when I found that our numerical standards were not the norm. Um, you'll see that uh, New York and Pennsylvania do not have numerical criteria for either nitrate or phosphorus. In Delaware, their numerical criteria are limited to these three small areas of the state where, I'm not from Delaware, but from what I understand, there's a pretty serious submerged aquatic vegetation issue in these bays. Um, so they're really trying to limit the amount of nutrients um, in this area. Um, in New Jersey, we do have numerical criteria, uh, but for our nitrate standard, it's two milligrams per liter, and that is specific to our Pinelands regions in the southern part of the state. Um, not much of which is in the Delaware Basin, I don't believe. Um, but for our phosphorus standards, we do have a standard of 0.1 milligrams per liter in streams and a lower standard of 0.05 in our lake system. Um, now, DRBC, I, I added an asterisk next to the X's here for DRBC. I don't want to just, you know, throw them out the window and say they don't have a standard uh, because I understand they have a special protection water program for which they do set, they don't set specific numerical criteria, but they require, as Ron mentioned earlier, that a stream must remain at or exceed existing water quality levels. And they have a network of monitoring sites from which they establish existing water quality. Um, but I think that we could hold a second Clean Water Act webinar to review all the methods that agencies use to implement protective measures that aren't necessarily based in, in standards. So again, I'll show you the EPA reference conditions for each ecoregion so you can compare to existing numerical criteria. Um, I'm not suggesting that these reference conditions are actual attainable goals for each state, uh, since clearly not every stream or lake is going to be in a reference condition. Um, but you'll see that we still have some ways to go in the development of strong protections against excessive nutrient inputs in the Delaware Basin. So let's sw switch gears to the other parameter I wanted to review today, pathogenic bacteria. Bacteria standards are generally dependent on the type of water body that you're assessing, whether it's freshwater as the Delaware Basin is in the north or tidal or brackish, uh, which the main stem is from Trenton South. Uh, there are multiple indicator taxa of pathogenic bacteria to use as an, uh, as an indicator for a water quality standard. Uh, total coliform is the most general indicator. It's typically used for drinking water since its presence really indicates any pathogenic coliform bacteria, and it's an easier test to run, honestly. Um, fecal coliform is an indicator that's more specific uh, due to its presence in the digestive tract, um, but E. coli is the most specific coliform indicator in use. Uh, the EPA recommended that all states adopt E. coli for their freshwater bacterial water quality standards back in 1986, I believe. 
um, because E. coli has a strong positive correlation between its concentration and, and the prevalence of gastrointestinal illness, while fecal coliform really does not have a strong correlation. Um, and since the bacterial water quality standard was established in protection of recreational uses, the indicator's correlation with human health impacts is really of the utmost importance. Um, enterococci concentrations are also very highly correlated with illness. So this indicator is also recommended by the EPA for state criteria for either freshwater or marine, um, but it's typically in use just for brackish or marine waters. So the EPA has developed two separate recommendations based on estimated illness rates. This is how something um, that affects a recreational use is, is developed. Um, so I hate to put it this way, <laughs> this is going to sound bleak, um, but a state really has to decide how many illnesses they're willing to permit in their waters when someone jumps in and, and, and takes a swim. Um, so there, there are two kind of protective measures based on enterococci and E. coli indicators. So here are the water quality standards for bacteria in relation uh, to the water's recreational use. Uh, we'll look at freshwater standards first, then go over the differences in brackish water. Uh, New York, PA, and uh, DRB, yeah, DRBC use fecal coliform in freshwaters rather than E. coli. Uh, and just to note, the geometric mean is widely used in this uh, sort of assessment because it negates the impact of outliers on the averages. So one you know, wild result won't completely throw the whole average. Um, however, most states, in addition to the geometric mean standard, also have a single sample maximum standard above which no samples should exceed. Uh, New Jersey uses the suggested EPA standard of E. coli in freshwater, and Delaware uses enterococci for its freshwater system. Uh, now, PA does something really interesting to me. Uh, their standard is much lower during the summer months when people are actually in the water. And it increases to a whopping 2,000 colonies per 100 milliliters in the colder months. Um, now you might want to say, hey, PA, why are you trying to work the system? What are you doing? Um, but in reality, I don't think that this seasonal standard change affects its assessments in a major way. Most of these regulatory bodies are collecting bacteria samples in the summer months anyway. Um, typically, it's just five samples in a 30-day period. Um, and from there, they derive their geometric mean. So I'm assuming that PA agency staff are not collecting bacteria samples in the winter, where a much higher result would still be within um, you know, their, their standard range. Uh, so Though only New Jersey is meeting the EPA recommendations, Delaware is using one of the suggested indicators, the enterococci, um, though its numerical standard is a, a bit above that of EPA's. Um, it's interesting though, that the criteria each state has for bathing beaches is more restrictive. And in most cases, it does meet the EPA recommendations. So it's great that these states have protective standards in place for people recreating in the water, but it may not lead to calling a water body impaired or establishing a TMDL. So on to brackish water standards. I've uh, removed New York from the list because they don't really have any brackish waters in the Delaware Basin. Pennsylvania uses the same standards for brackish water as they do for fresh water. Uh, but New Jersey and the DRBC change up their standard from E. coli and fecal coliform to enterococci for their brackish waters. Uh, Delaware reduces their numerical criteria from fresh water, uh, where it was a geometric mean of 100 and now it's 35 in brackish waters. And so that brings New Jersey, Delaware, and DRBC into agreement with EPA's suggested standards for bacteria. So 
so we've only just looked at just two of, of the many different parameters agencies are monitoring in our waterways. Uh, but what are the implications of these varying standards? Well, honestly, it's hard to say. <laughs> um, there is still quite a lack of, of information for large stretches of the Delaware Basin. And you'll see that these geographic gaps that I've circled here occur pretty much in, in every state. Uh, this map shows uh, specifically the bacterial impairments in the basin. And this is from the River Network's wonderful paper on recreational use standards where they've basically reviewed all of this material. I highly suggest you check it out for more information. Um, but in New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, waters are assessed by stream segment. So you'll see the red lines indicate impaired waters, green lines uh, indicate waters meeting the criteria and grayed out sections um, are those areas with a lack of data. And New Jersey assesses waters using the HUC 14 sub watershed unit with red, green, and gray representing the same as the rest of the states. But this map also shows the yellow sub watersheds in New Jersey where TMDLs are already in place for bacteria. Uh, one of the other questions I was hoping to be able to answer was uh, if states with less stringent water quality standards then see fewer impairments overall specific to the Delaware Basin. Um, it seems like it would be a logical hypothesis, but again, there really isn't enough information to make this assessment. Um, so the moral of the story <laughs> is that we all really need to be out there collecting more data, uh, both to substantiate our respective water quality standards, um, but also because collecting water quality data is how we then go on to establish protections or improvements on our waters. So thank you so much. I think I'm gonna toss it back to Ellen. Great, thank you very much, Erin. Um, I realize we're getting a little close on time, but I, and I have not seen a single question posted in chat, which I find astounding for a group of 40 people. Um, but just to give you a second to digest some of what you've heard, uh, and because I have a couple questions that I'll share with the panel, I think we would have time for a couple questions. So if you have one, go ahead and put it in the chat. Ellen, we um, we did set this until ten thirty, so we oh, oh good oh I'm or eleven thirty. I'm sorry, we got no, plenty no. of time for some questions. Um, so think about what you've heard. I mean, uh, what I really enjoyed about all the presentations, and thank you all three of you so much. I really enjoyed the different framing that you each brought to your presentation. I thought it was really helpful um, to have those different perspectives and and hear the different approaches that you've taken. So. Um, one of the questions that um, I want to ask panel and to uh, you know reflect on is what are the you know Ron you laid out that for for tox for metals anyway there's been this evolution over a long period of time of how we've been um, assessing the impacts of metals so what are, I'm just curious from all three of you what do you feel are the barriers to regulatory agencies to establish more protective numerical standards. Anybody want to jump in on that one to start out? I can hop in here. Um, so I, I think with a lot of, of the criteria establishment, you have to think about, well, states are thinking about the triple bottom line. Um, so they, they could hop in with the most restrictive actual numerical standards, but that's really going to limit um, Business's ability to to discharge into waters, right? Uh, so it's kind of like this this balancing act that states have to play to be able to protect their streams, but also permit business to continue to occur. So I I, I think there's always this like back and forth, this push and pull between business and environment um, that prevents agencies from establishing the most stringent standards. So I'm also curious with respect to that question, um, when we were putting the, together this workshop, um, Adam, you noted that you were actually surprised at the number of um, new criteria that you were seeing um, when you went back and looked at what's been happening in the basin. So, you know, yes, it's hard to adopt stringent, uh, you know, it may be challenging from a regulatory perspective, and yet we are seeing it. 
right? Like we are seeing some new standards and as Ron described, we are seeing like an, a reassessment of how we're looking at metals. Um, so I'm just curious if Ron or Adam, you have anything else to add to that question? Any other responses? Um, well, I, th I think one limitation is, is uh, you know, budgets and bandwidth. Um, anytime that you're going to produce a new assessment method, um, that's, it's obviously got, got to be, um, you know, founded in, in good rigorous science. Um, it, it takes a lot of investment to go out there and make sure you, A, have enough data to be able to complete, complete that exercise, but then um, whatever technical expertise you need to leverage to develop that new assessment and then get that through and uh, all the way into policy, it's a it's a pretty substantial undertaking, um, and so I, it, on the cycle of maybe every every ten years or so, you might see biological um, criteria be redefined with a new a new assessment method. And there's also some concerns about doing that, um, just because then the, their whole integrated report might change. You know, when you, when you adopt a new assessment method it can shake up a lot of what you've been doing the last 10 years if suddenly you're working with a new uh, yardstick. Yeah, I would agree with both Aaron and Adam. It's a combination of the, the um, complexity of the, the as the science gets more complicated and the how to implement the, the measuring, the measurements that need to be done. So I think the states, all agencies like we realize you have to, like with the biotic ligand model, it's like the science is advanced and then it's like, we're at the point like, okay, but that's so much information, we really can't gather all that information. So let's look back and can we make it simpler and still be protective? So that's one aspect. And then there is the balance between, uh, you know, being a defense, is it a defensible uh, standard that, you know, you can go to the, the business community and say, well, you have to change because this is uh, really, uh, from what we know, the number that you should be meeting. So Ron, just building on what you were saying about the metals there, we did have a question about whether the, the ligand standard you described could have a bearing on fish consumption advisories. Well, the biotic ligand model is, is, is geared more to aquatic life protection. Fish consumption, we do have a, a separate uh, monitoring that does that and the fish consumption advisories are set on that and they are also set by the states. We collect data to inform the states. Um, another question about metals. Um, do we understand the relative contribution of metals from per, from permitted point sources versus MS4s or other sources? Um, well, we haven't, uh, we don't have a TMDL for the metal, any metal that in the Delaware that we collect data to be that specific at this point, but we have general information about different sources of metals, but not a per percentage that comes from the different, uh, types of discharges. I don't have that information. Do you have it, just from your knowledge, do you know of any metals that are of particular concerns for MS4? And by the way, MS4 stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. And so it's basically stormwater from a stormwater system. Do we know anything about metals coming from MS4? Well, metals do come just from like tire, you know, wear. So I'm sure that that would be basically stormwater runoff. So anything that's in stormwater runoff would be okay. an issue. Okay. Um, so a question here about the data gaps. And so maybe Aaron, maybe for you, but for everybody really, can you reflect on what it takes for a nonprofit or a non-governmental organization to be part of collecting data such that it could help fill those gaps like if in an official way? I love that question. I feel like that was the perfect setup Nathan, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are tons of ways for, for nonprofit organizations to get involved. Of course, uh, we could do a whole separate session um, instead of comparing state water quality standards, we could compare the way that states uh, treat citizen science data. <laughs> and, it, and we would have see just as much variability, honestly. Um, I, again, my biases, I'm from New Jersey. We're very lucky in New Jersey that we have uh, a program called the Watershed Watch Network, which is um, basically a service provider for community monitoring organizations to build up their programs, uh, first to identify where the, where the data gaps are, and then to pinpoint existing organizations, maybe that are focused on advocacy work. 
and try to instill some knowledge and confidence and, and tons of training so that they would be able to also collect data. Um, so there are many, many groups doing watershed work in the Delaware Basin. And um, we're working with a few of those organizations like the Sourland Conservancy or Steamboat Splash um, on the New Jersey side just to kind of train their volunteers and get them out in the field and start filling in some of those gaps. Um, for the groups that are in other states other than New Jersey, um, you know, I, I can't really speak to kind of how those states uh, treat your citizen science groups. I have to say that um, in some states, while some are very kind of accepting of community monitoring data and they accept that there will be quality assurance protocols established to, to verify the quality of the data. Um, other states couldn't care less about any QA measures that you implement into your study design. They're just not gonna accept any data from a regular citizen. Um, so I, I think that would be a really great study to, to look into the Delaware Basin states and how they, how they work with citizen science groups because we definitely have tons of data gaps to fill. If, uh, if I can add for, for a moment um, to, to get an, an, a certain aspect of Nathan's question, of course, there's a lot of citizen science data that can be useful um, in these purposes, but for the specific purpose of listing, the states usually um, have a data quality objective where it, it needs to meet basically their, their exact methods. It needs to meet their data quality objectives that they use for their own assessment data. And so for any NGO that's interested in having their data used for that purpose, um, the best thing you're going to have to do is, 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 is get that training, uh, the exact methods, the exact uh, that they follow, and then follow their, their data submission procedures um, exactly the way that, that, that they stipulate. And, and so that is a very high bar for a lot of groups. Um, to be able to follow those methods specifically the way a state agency will, but, but under the Clean Water Act and for the purpose of regulatory listing, that's the data quality objective they have to meet. So the Clean Water Act also says that states need to use any and all available data, you know. So there, there's, again, this balance act between trying to make a comprehensive assessment, but also having it be a high quality assessment. Um, here in New Jersey, we're working with with groups to, and MDEP has been great in, in allowing us uh, to kind of dive into their methods. Um, they have this whole committee that's available to answer questions specific to community monitoring groups. So if we say, okay, we're developing this quality assurance project plan and we have a question about this specific method, we have folks from multiple bureaus at DEP who are there to kind of to guide people through it. Um, so we're really fortunate, and and you're right, Adam. It is a really high bar for a lot of organizations um, to meet, but I think it definitely can be done. Yeah, and I think that the, part of what I hear you saying there too, Erin, is that even if you've got data that doesn't meet that high bar, there are ways that data can be used. And so, I mean, what I've seen in some settings is that data can be used to say, hey, you know. Pennsylvania DEP, we found this. Can you do your assessment here? Because this is troubling to us. Um, can you talk a little bit about, Adam and, and, and Ron, chime in if you'd like to, but can you talk a little bit about how data that doesn't meet that high bar can be used or how you've seen it used? I, um, I see that someone made a comment uh, that PA DEP has a three-tiered system. And New Jersey operates the same way. And so that's the way that, that the states are classifying community monitoring data. Um, in New Jersey, at, at least tier three would be your regulatory level data. Uh, you're matching the agency protocols. You There's tons of QA measures in place. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, tier one would be your educational monitoring. Um, you may collect it, some data to take to your local municipality and you're trying to advocate for some stronger regulations on kind of a small smaller scale. Um, but tier two is what we call our targeting type of monitoring. So that's exactly what, what you were talking about, Ellen. Um, if you have installed a, a restoration project and you're trying to measure 
the effects of that you would you monitor beforehand and afterward. And you can make a pretty good assessment of the impact of that restoration project without using exactly the methods that DEP are using. Um, but the other part of targeting is, is, yeah, collecting data, identifying a problem, and then going to DEP and saying, there is a problem here. You need to focus your efforts here uh, so that we can actually get this you know, on the books in the integrated report uh, so that something can actually be done about it. So I'm, I'm glad to see that other, other uh, states are using that three-tiered system as well. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? No, no, I think I think she nailed it. And that's the, the exact point of that three-tiered system. So they, they can take data, but there would be levels to the to where it can be used now. Okay. So along this, um, you know, how how others can help with understanding what's going on in water body, we have a question about um, MS4 permittees and whether you guys have any advice for um, folks who are working with those permittees when they have impaired streams. Um, so in Pennsylvania, the MS4 permit right now focuses a lot, this, this five-year cycle MS4 permit focuses a lot on sediment reductions. So they're required to do a lot of work to reduce sediment. Um, but the question is, should they sample or monitor their streams to see if their efforts are resulting in improvements? DEP isn't requiring that um, is, and maybe not even recommending that, that permittees do monitoring, but, um, and the, the final sentence of the comment is, this can be frustrating if PA DEP relies on a very long monitoring cycle. So like, the, you know, the, just your thoughts about how to support MS4 communities and whether, whether it's worth the monitoring and, and what, and how to do it, I guess. Um, well, in the case of Pennsylvania and those, those very numerous sediment listings, most of those are coming from aquatic life um, macroinvertebrate samples. So they found a macroinvertebrate community that did not, um, that, that showed impairment. And then through their biological stressor ID process, they, they selected sediment. And sediment is often looked at as a pollutant that, um, well, if we develop a TMDL to try to reduce sediment, it's kind of a catch-all pollutant. We think we're going to be, by the BMPs that we put in place, we're going to be reducing stormwater, we're going to be reducing nutrients, we're going to be reducing runoff of toxics, because we are trying to attack uh, sediment, which is really a, a, a transport vehicle for a myriad of pollutants that, that may be synergistically causing this decline in this aquatic life community. So I, I would say for the purposes of, you know, maybe going out and measuring sediment specifically isn't necessarily going to be useful because that wasn't necessarily what went into that listing in the first place. So it really is, it's a biological community um, that is driving that impact in a lot of those cases. And, and so in that case, yes, it's good to do some routine biological monitoring and maybe if the state's only going by there once every five years, um, you could uh, fill in the gaps in between, um, but also know that you know, these are biological communities that can take a long time necessarily to, to respond um, to improvements in a watershed. Um, and so, Yes and no. Uh, I don't know if I gave a very, a very clean, clear answer on that, but you know, keep driving at those improvements, and I mean, hopefully, we're going to see uh, biological communities improve in time. Well, I, I really appreciate the way you talked about the sediment being, you know, seen as sort of a catch-all pollutant because that I think has been very challenging for municipalities to understand that um, it's not just about reducing the sediment load itself. It's about creating a healthy aquatic environment. And that, that's a little bit of a disconnect because that's not how the permit is explained, but that is how they're assessing the waters. Right. Did anybody else have any other thoughts about um, MS4, monitoring MS4s? Okay. Um, uh, I think I've gone through all the questions in the chat. If I didn't hit your question, please remind me because we've gotten far enough down in the chat that I may have missed it further up. But I have a couple of questions for you guys um, to, to um, respond to as well. Uh, <clears throat> I've heard, a, a, you know, from a lot of the folks that we work with that climate change is becoming more and more of an, uh, you know, a focus of what they want to do and questioning how do we know when, whether climate change is impacting 
my watershed impacting water quality in my stream. So what would your, do you have any suggestions for how to track which criteria to be looking at, what parameters to be looking at, how to be monitoring so that you have a better, that you might have a better sense of what, what's happening with respect to your watershed, you know, the watershed you wanna work in um, and how climate change is impacting it. Well, I'll put in a plug for it. We do have a new advisory committee, uh, climate change advisory committee at the DRBC. So uh, you might want to follow that activities that's going on there. I would say that, that that's what I would say on that topic right now. So I think, you know, we can expect um, a, a, a couple of parameters maybe are, are directly tied to change in climate. Um, we can expect loosely that temperatures will, will be going up. Um, and we can expect um, mostly some, some disturbance in our, in our weather events. Um, and so, you know, aspects of how we handle those, those changing weather events might, might show up as far as increasing road salt, increasing chlorides, those, those types of things. Um, you could see trends um, associated with climate change. Um, be very hard to detect over time, uh, to be honest with you, particularly like observing a, a change in temperature because obviously our daily and seasonal fluctuations are a lot larger than, than the, the, the increases that we're ex uh, expecting to see from, from one year to another. The disturbance events are, are a big one, I think. Um, we can expect that we're starting to see streams being listed for disturbances in natural flow regimes. And, and so really it comes, it comes back to the ecology and those, those biological communities. Um, that's where we're going to see kind of the synergistic increased impacts that climate change might be bringing to already stressed systems. It, it, it will be those biological communities that will be the, probably the easiest place to detect um, a net change that is occurring. I think it's also important to, to take note of where you're placing your monitoring sites, especially when it comes to monitoring climate change. Um, because climate change has been uh, happening con concurrently with increasing development, um, increasing impervious cover. So you, uh, and while, you know, <laughs> there are certainly some, some impacts that could be seen as far as just stormwater flows off of impervious cover during some of those insane rain events, um, placing a monitoring site out in the middle of nowhere where it's not really, it's kind of natural conditions, um, ambient, it's not affected by urban development, then you can really measure cha those changes in, in temperature and uh, resulting changes in dissolved oxygen and fluctuations in pH or whatever um, without that kind of extra factor of, of urban development. Oh, that's really interesting, Erin. I thought you were going in a different direction. I thought you were going to say you might want to have some monitoring sites so that you can see the impacts from these disturbance events. But what I hear you saying is, actually, if you really want to see what's happening from climate change, you don't. You want to be able to, to to sort of isolate that this is what's going on, and that impervious cover might um, you, might might haha <laughs> quote unquote muddy the waters. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> development's like an extra variable, right? So you yeah. can you can kind of remove it. Right, 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 right. So a, a number of years ago, EPA had a, a lot of the basin states in Region 3 and all up and down the East Coast uh, identify some of their, their best sentinel sites, um, their reference sites, just for the purposes of doing some increased temperature monitoring at those locations for that exact reason, because in order to detect any any increase in temperature or disturbance from, from climate change, you're gonna to need to remove all the other anthropogenic factors. So places where we don't expect to see any other changes taking place over the next 25 years will be the places we might be able to directly observe changes from climate change. So those studies are in place, but there'll be decades before that data can really be looked at and interpreted. Yeah, okay. Um, and by the way, for those of you who might not have noticed, Ron did post a link to the advisory, to DRBC's Advisory Committee for Climate Change in the chat. Um, so another question here about how we can leverage permits to, um, towards these relevant water quality criteria. Um, you know, what's been interesting about this conversation is it's pretty clear, like the biological um, criteria that we're looking at the way Adam you know, described it, I think is really helpful. 
that a lot of those criteria are used in terms of assessment. We don't see those criteria in permits, right? That we don't see you've got to hit a certain IBI score in your permit. So how can we how can we leverage permits to work towards relative relevant water quality criteria? Are there other or are there other aspects of permit writing or the permit process, permit review that lend themselves to a role for folks in you know, nonprofit organizations, non-governmental partners who are engaged in monitoring? Um, you know, let's see, if it's not going to be the streams monitoring data because of the time frame is too long, is it too noisy to see a response? You know, those kinds of things. What are your thoughts about how we leverage um, what we're the permits for meeting water quality criteria. I think that uh, speaking from an, an NGO, the Watershed Institute, I'm not sure that we we play a, a huge role in in that aspect of, of water quality protections. But I think that's an interesting question and something that deserves more exploration of how we can insert ourselves into the process. I, I think when uh, it, it's important to when a new permit is coming up for, for public comment, it is important to take a look at it um, and, and if it's in your watershed. And I mean, just just using your, your best professional judgment is the monitoring that is stipulated uh, in that permit. Does it make sense to you as far as uh, driving it at, at limiting that that particular pollutant um, and maybe within the, the monitoring context of that river. Um, because you will see sometimes things like the location that's stipulated in, in the monitoring of the permit, maybe a very long mixing zone or, or something to that effect where you could um, advocate for some, some better monitoring um, at the end of pipe or at the end of a mixing zone. Um, and you could also, you know, there, there are examples of folks that then do go and follow up with their own monitoring that is the, the way it is described to be done in that permit, they'll also go to those same locations and just do a double check of themselves um, to collect their own data. Um, so I think those, those are some aspects where NGOs can get, that they can interact with permits a little bit as it relates to monitoring and protection of these uses. So just to clarify, oh, go ahead, Ron. I just uh, put another link on the, in the chat it's a link to the interactive maps that we have on our website. And it's a really nice, one of the maps is really nice. You can actually see which permits are being reviewed in our project review. And I think that would be helpful for different people to know what's happening and then you can get in, engaged in the process. And it does have an impact on the decision. Thank you very much, Ron, for posting that and for pointing that out. So but to go back to Adam's um, comment about the monitoring that's in a permit. So I just wanna clarify for point source MPDES permits, there often is a monitoring element in that permit. That's generally not the case um, with MS4 permits, with those, those um, municipal stormwater permits, there's often not a monitoring requirement there. And that was, I think the earlier question was relating to that, like, ah, there's no monitoring required here, should there be? Um, so I just want to clarify that sometimes permits do require monitoring and do require, um, you know, reporting out. So for those um, those point source permits, they're very geared towards specific, frankly, chemical parameters, right? Like you've got to meet this level of this chemical in your outfall. We're going to take a sample of water. We're going to look for those chemicals and see if it's there. Um, and yet what we've been talking about and what Adam has so nicely pointed out is that really the best way to understand what's going on, what I hear anyway, is the best way to understand what's going on and how healthy your stream is. You've got to look at a, at a bunch of different factors and you want to look at, at how, those param how those chemical pollutants might be affecting the aquatic life in that stream. Um, and so I, I almost feel like the question might have been driving at, should we be including an IBI score in a permit? Um, you know, because we we know the chemical parameters are really important, but, but like even in the MS4 permit, we're not helping that permittee understand the link between what we're, you know, like that pollutant and what we really want to see improved. What do you think about that, about having an IBI score? In a, I don't know if it would ever be possible, but, you know, let's just pretend we're in a world where that could be possible. What do you think about having some kind of a biological element to permits? Hmm. Um, I, I, I like the idea. Um, of, of course, you know, those, 
that, that biological community is going to be assimilating everything that's happening upstream of that discharge as well. Well, that's true. Um, so, so that that makes it a little tricky. You can always do some bracket sampling. You you can you know assess the biological community upstream and downstream. But then again, you have to make sure that it's really apples to apples. You know that that habitat is just as acceptable to that biological community, and there isn't uh, some you know impact of a, a tributary that's still lingering on that side. So the, it, it would get complicated. But I, I like the idea, and you're right. You know those those. TMDLs and those listings usually get put in place because of an aquatic community, but then ultimately that's not what we're measuring progress against. So there always is a bit of a, um, a, a disjunct uh, in this process, particularly when you're looking at biological communities for the assessment. Okay. Doesn't look like Aaron or Ron really wants to chime in on that one, and I'll respect no, I that. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. I think there's too many factors at play. Um, I, as Nathan put it in the comments, the system is too noisy, I think, to, to really include that as, as something that can be attributable to a specific right. point. Right, you know? right. Well, and to have it in a regulatory document makes it really Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. There have there's been a, in, I know there's been at least one at time that and it may have been more that, that this has been attempted in our um, dockets. Oh, really? Yeah, but uh, I think it's Adam is exactly correct. It's hard to tease out exactly what's happening. So it's not huh. generally done. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I didn't know it had been done in your dockets. Thank, thanks for in the past, Ron. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay. So this is going to be my last question. And unless anybody Just else. Say, not, that, an MS, not an MS4. It was a point source. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I just wanted to, like, I'm going to ask this last question. If others have, uh, if you have a question that you've been dying to ask and haven't done it, put it in the chat. So my last question has to do, uh, sort of dovetails on this, that we've been talking about different, you know, specific criteria that we could be looking at in a watershed. Um, and maybe there, so if I'm, I'm, if I'm working in a watershed and I want to figure out how am I going to um, structure my monitoring program to get the best information I can for my watershed, um, should I be looking at a particular stressor and monitoring for that? Like, like maybe sediment that you know could be, you know, representative of a bunch of different, um, you know, uh, a catch-all as Adam put it, a pollutant. Or should I be looking, say, take a stretch of stream and maybe it'd be nice to know how long of a stretch of stream and like really paying attention to a bunch of different parameters and looking at the aquatic life in that part um, to get an understanding of what might be going on. I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about that, like looking at a particular stretch, looking at it up and down, a particular parameter, looking at it up and down your watershed or looking at maybe one or two stretches in depth. Any preference for either strategy? That is such a, a tough question. <laughs> I, I, I think that's that's kind of what the state agents, all regulatory bodies have to answer for in, in every type of monitoring program they develop. Um, again, the idea of the Clean Water Act is to have a comprehensive review of water quality. Um, but is that geographically or is that uh, intensive in a specific site? I mean, that's, that's the question, right? So, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yes, to <do> both. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. In the ideal world, we do both. Right. I guess that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why the states have the rotating, uh, you know, basin type monitoring. And I guess for the DRBC, we have like uh, like the boat run or the estuary monitoring that is uh, like a, a really a trends monitoring. So there are certain parameters we want to measure all the time so we can see the trends. But then there are other sites where we might want to have a more uh, in-depth study. So it's, it's, it is both, but it's, a, it's always a balancing act and it's also um, limited by funding. Mm. Good morning, Ellen. This is Namsu from TRBC and uh, I was in and out of this meeting. I have another meeting ongoing, uh, but since Nathan put the question, uh, supposedly private, but out there, so uh, maybe links number of things of the permit and uh, uh, monitoring into the permit and other things. Uh, permit usually for F1 specific. What is the cause in, uh, into the water uh, ambient water? Based on that, 
calculate back to the effluent limit calculation. Uh, we do not look into the biological impact separately, but uh, we usually apply the model, especially for the spatial protection waters. So we look into the cumulative impacts of point sources and non-point sources when we drive the uh, effluent limits. Uh, so that's somewhat not directly consider ambient monitoring, but model can predict the, what's the ambient water quality should be under the given uh, effluent conditions. So that's the, my answer. So model is great tool to uh, utilize. And uh, when you impose ambient monitoring for the permit, that is the cost, especially for the MS4. That's the burden to the MS4 without knowing clear cause and effect. That's a bit difficult to sell to me at this point. But at the same time, for PCBs, for example, for Delaware specifically put some PCB monitoring for certain MS4s to track that study and to minimize the PCB into the estuary. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Namsu, for chiming in. Um, it is 11.31. Uh, we've had, this has been a, well, I have thoroughly enjoyed it, but I always enjoy talking about the Clean Water Act. So I want to thank our presenters very much. Thank you, Ron, Adam, and Aaron. Thank you, Colleen, for putting this all together. She's a rock star. Um, and thank you all for attending. This has been recorded, and so we will share a link to the recording for you to share with other colleagues if you'd like. Colleen, anything else to wrap up? put a link to an evaluation in the chat. If you have a few minutes to evaluate this presentation, that would be wonderful. And other than that, thank you all very much. Thank you to our presenters. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.